this is going to somehow become a nightshirt. Let's let's go on this really unhinged um, journey with me. Let's go. 179 years ago, in 1843, Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol, bringing to us such characters as Tiny Tim, Bob Cratchit, and of course, Ebenezer Scrooge, into the world which would become mainstays of Western Christmas tradition, spawning hundreds upon hundreds of plays, films, and TV adaptations. But it wasn't until 30 years ago that the art of the telling of A Christmas Carol reached its zenith, a peak which has yet to be surpassed and most likely never will. I am, of course, referring to A Muppet's Christmas Carol, the best adaptation ever. Now, whilst in this version, our Scrooge, played by Michael Caine, kept his dressing gown on and didn't show us the delights of his nightshirt underneath, but this doesn't matter, and I'm just making a Regency nightshirt because I need one. It fits the theme of being vaguely Christmassy, and to be honest, Scrooge was so tight he may have never even bought a new one from when he was younger. So deal with it. Now for my Regency nightshirt interpretation, I will be using a vintage linen sheet. So here's the linen sheet, which is wonderfully soft, and as you can see, there's machine stitching on it. So because of the age, I'm thinking it's possibly early 20th century, something like that. No real way to know. So I was looking at the length and realising, well, how long should a Regency Georgian nightshirt be? Now, looking from examples from the period, you tend to see all sorts generally from people rushing out of bed, or people that are invalids, as it were, and people who are ill, all of that sort of thing. Um, but then when looking at originals, it's quite tricky necessarily to tell which ones belong to men and which ones belong to women. I'm sort of going for a happy medium. Another wonderful thing about this linen, because of its age, and because of the way that linen has been made historically, it has a blind edge on it which is really, really useful. So it means that the edge is bound without that fluffy edge that you're used to seeing on fabric when you buy it. Now, it's tricky to get fully in frame quite how long this is. Now, my shirts, for example, come down to sort of about there, and I'm like, fine, but let's go for something longer. It's a night shirt after all. So firstly, I decided to check the length of this, and I thought I could take advantage of the already finished hems. So, all I have to do is find the middle, which is there, wrap it on myself and realise that it comes to about ankle length on me, which is really, really useful. Obviously, you wouldn't be wearing boots with these, but I may find an opportunity where, you know, I might do. Like now, for example. It's cold. It's winter. Leave me be. And as well as using the rest of the fabric for the sleeve, collar and ruffles, I might also be able to squeeze out an ordinary shirt. So it's a win-win. But also, it's a little bit togery. I'm feeling very sort of neoclassical or something in some way. I have no idea how to do it. At the moment I just feel like a bedsheet or a ghost. So I thought because the overall theme I'm going for is something along the lines of Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol, because of course Scrooge, wear, Scrooge wears a nightshirt, I thought it would also be quite interesting if I just went as one of the ghosts. So this is just the ghost of Christmas past. Um, excuse me while I go get some chains. This is clearly the point in the um, creation of the video where I've literally lost all sense of self and mind. As with any sewing project, the planning is key, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. My vintage linen sheet is a rectangular shape, which is just swell, I guess. So the shortest edge is 88 inches long, and the longest edge is 113 inches long. So I decided that for the night shirt, I was going to make it a little bit wider than I would normally my shirts and have it at 36 inches, which is, of course, a yard. So I thought, eh, that's fine. And that T-shape is for the sort of 
the situation of the collar and the bosom front. This is all just a rough sketch plan because after all this is just for me. This isn't a pattern I'm selling. So this piece is 22 inches long which is going to be um, the sleeves. The sleeves are obviously longer than they are wider because of arms and then it's gathered in. So I'm doing 22 inches by 24 inches because I feel that for a night shirt you want a bit more movement in there. And that leaves, so I'm cutting out four sets of sleeves because of course I'm trying to trying to move in uh, having another shirt in here as well. And the rest is 17 inches down there, which will be for, like, I'm not sure, it gets worked out. Um, 72 inches so that my shirts are, you know, a yard down the front, which seems to be sort of about standard for the period. And then of course what's really important, you cannot forget, is that for the remaining 41 inches in this little corner piece will of course be for the cuffs, collar and of course the shirt frills which are absolutely vital for the night shirt and of course general men's shirts. And shout out to Queer Britain for their wonderful pen, thanks. Here is the linen itself, so I mark out where my first piece is, 36 mark that out with a pen because sue me and then cut it in place and here is where the wonder the art and the also terror of thread pulling begins you single out a thread and you literally pull along you have to be really careful not to snap it it will happen it will happen so you just need to be prepared for that and work with it but here's a nice little close-up so you can see how it works pull along the thread and it comes out really really nicely which leaves a nice gap between threads something for you to cut along okay so slight complication. Uh, I've pulled the thread along one side so the width should be fine. Now because one edge is of course this bound selvage, this this is clearly the straight of grain. There's nothing there's nothing that can be changed about that. So I thought okay that's the length. So I decided to then go up the same amount and half it and pin at the very top just so I could make sure that everything is hunky dory. This is why thread pulling really helps because <laughs> um, there's a bit of a problem here, but there's a significant sort of gap between where they should be. And then, upon further inspection, I noticed that the hems on this don't at all follow the straight of grain. So, what I've got to do. Um, is I've got to find the new bottom for this. Otherwise, when it's on me, straight of grain will be fine on the sides, but it'll sort of wonk to one side because the bottom itself is technically slanted. So now I need to square off the shortest edge and go along there, and that will become my new bottom edge, which I can then turn and hem. So when I thought I would be actually saving time with hemming, it turns out um, I won't be. That's fine. We move, we carry on. This is the art of just doing things. Oh, this just means more thread pulling, which at this point is becoming my life. Um, so yeah, more thread pulling. You have to tease and gather it along with the thumb and fingers. And remember, this is an art of being patient. And at some point it'll snap. And if that does happen, you can follow along where you are and with a pin, delicately find the thread you are pulling and sort of tease it out of there to start afresh. It takes practice, but it ends up being apparently quite relaxing, people say. And then you just cut along between the threads. All right, so I've done that and taken about sort of four and a half inches off of each side. That adds up, it really does. But luckily, I can still use these pieces because piecing is period. So I'm going to take a nice square of four inch square from each one of these 
and use them as the neck gussets. So, yay! Let's go! Shirts throughout history are a geometric affair. So the whole thing is formed of squares and rectangles. So these neck gussets are square pieces that are folded in half, pressed, cut, and then the ends pressed again so that each piece will be symmetrical to the other, which means that when you're forming the neck gusset, the pieces will fit together perfectly and create a nice stronghold around the neck. All right, now we've sorted that out, this now hangs perfectly straight. Fantastic. So now I've found the middle point up here and I'm gonna pull a thread right in the center, which will help give me the exact middle, which will mean I can put in place the opening for the neck and the slit for the front. So, you guessed it, more thread pulling. Yay! <laughs> ah! Once you've pulled out the thread across the shoulder line, you can then determine the middle and therefore where you should cut in order to make the opening for the neck, which will be the collar, and as well as the front for the bosom slit and for all the frills and everything to be attached. All right then, I've cut the chest slit and the neck slit. I cut the neck slit a little bit larger because there's so much fabric, so I wanted to sort of gather, gather together. So here we have the sort of length, as it were, which I think is a very good length. Now we attach the neck gussets. First are the ones that go on the inside of the shirt so that any untidy stitching and everything will be hidden by the ones that are top stitched on top. So both are top stitched, admittedly by machine. I'm not doing this by hand. And this is obviously sped up because I am not this quick and not this good, but it comes out really well. Now I take my sleeve pieces and gussets and put them together. So first I put one side of the gusset against the sleeve, sew that on, making sure that there is a step of about a quarter of an inch between them which will help with the felling process. The machine fell down, top stitch the insides as well, because once again, I'm not going to be doing this by, by hand. Absolutely pointless for this. Now we get to the gathering, and to do this what I do is I release the tension of the thread on the top, and leave the bottom as normal and increase the stitch to, you know, mid, something like that, three or four, something like that, to give us nice big gathers. And I like to do this on all the bits that are gonna be gathered. So that's the cuff, the shoulder of the sleeve, and the collar. I like to just gather them all at once so that they're all under the same amount of tension and everything so that I don't have to worry about fiddling with any of my tension ever again because it's a real pain otherwise. Now that we have gathered the cuff evenly, we can pin and put it into place and sew it on to the cuff itself, securing all those gathers. And then once we've done that, we can then press it, turn it over, and then top stitch the entire cuff into place. The same method is used on the collar as well. And then you attach the sleeves in an almost similar way, but making sure the gathers are nice and even, but also more towards the top of the shoulder. All right then, okay, so arms and collar attached. Yeah, I'm still wearing stuff underneath. I'm just gauging the important thing of how far down do I want to sew the side? So I think probably to about knee level so that I can maneuver. But yeah, otherwise I'm quite enjoying it. There's still lots to do, but yeah, bits of it are together. Once the side seams are sewn in and felled, now it's time to do the hem. The thing I thought I was saving time on. Hems I've observed on original shirts and garments were often exceptionally thin. This was to save fabric. So with this, all I'm doing is I'm pressing down about a quarter of an inch and then turning it over and pressing again. Some are even smaller at an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch. A defining characteristic of night shirts of the period seemed to be the frills along the chest, bottom slit, and the collar. Also, upon closer inspection of the collar, I think there's a slight cutaway, so I'll deal with that just now, and then I'll whip stitch gather all of the frills 
to the shirt itself, do the buttons and buttonholes, and hope you guys are ready for a reveal. I feel like Frodo, yeah, Frodo, when he gets attacked by the spider and he's like, 